Good morning. Welcome to our Friday session of uh, hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development in Education Online. This is our final session of this amazing week that we've had, and we've had a, a, a really full and diverse lineup uh, this week. Finished off yesterday with a really, really emotive and thought-provoking session on uh, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism, where we had a panel of over 15 people and we had viewers from over 15 countries in the end. And we had a packed out webinar on here on Zoom. And we we're also live streaming on YouTube. And that session has been recorded and it has been edited and has been uploaded onto our Chilton Teaching School Alliance YouTube channel. Uh, do head on over there. Have a watch, have a rewatch, share it with your colleagues, make it part of your whole school discussion regarding how are you going to move your school forward with the issues that uh, have definitely come to light. Uh, recently but have been prevailing with us for a long time. Today we have from Chonya High School for Boys, we've got Mark Mailer and Daniel Connor who will be looking at how did, how did they embed a reading culture uh, in a school full of boys from a, a very diverse um, and ethnic mix, the challenges that they had and the things that they actually um, embedded within their day-to-day -day culture. It's going to be a fascinating uh, session and something that I think is dear to a lot of our hearts as teachers. You know, reading is, is so important and getting our students engaged in that, in it, however we do that, is absolutely vital. It has an impact on everything that they do. Over on Twitter today, um, we have the fantastic Anne Palmer, who will be taking over our Twitter handle, which is at Chilton TSA. Follow her, follow the uh, Chilton Twitter handle, engage with us on there, share us your gloomy pictures from where you are in the UK and make us jealous of the pictures from those of you that are abroad. We look forward to engaging with you during the session and without further ado, let's jump straight into their presentation. Welcome to our session on creating a whole school reading strategy. I'm Daniel Connor, the head of the school, and I've been in post for seven years now. I'm an English teacher by trade. My first degree is in English and American literature, and I love reading. And certainly that is a tremendous advantage to establishing a culture of reading that we hope courses through the very veins and arteries of this school nourishing it both academically and pastorally. I'm joined this morning by Mark Mailer one of the school's assistant head teachers. He's another bibliophile who shares my passion for great literature. Now, during school closure, I've been enjoying revisiting some of the classic literature from my youth. And I've just finished reading Middlemarch by George Eliot again after 40 years. If you haven't read it, I heartily recommend it to you. If you have the stamina for an extremely long novel, you will be richly rewarded by one of the most moving and powerful analyses of the redemptive power of empathy and forgiveness that you will ever encounter. Not to mention incisive observation after incisive observation about pretty much most aspects of the human condition that you care to contemplate. What are you reading at the moment, Mark? Thanks, Daniel. I've just finished reading the Booker Prize winning Disgrace by J.M. Kutzi. The subject matter was tough going and the ending left me wanting some sense of optimism, but that's just not Kutsi's domain. It's set in post-apartheid South Africa and the social and political conflict forms the backdrop to the central character. A university lecturer who is dis dismissed for gross misconduct and the novel tracks how he uses this opportunity to join his daughter in the country and help on her farm. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but if you think being dismissed is bad enough, things get a whole lot worse for the pair of them. Honestly, I just can't recommend Kutsi's work highly enough. I hope that little dialogue didn't sound self-indulgent. It wasn't meant to be. What I want to establish right at the outset is that if you're going to be successful in developing a deep and rich reading culture in your school, there needs to be a genuine love and understanding of the joy of reading and the importance of reading strategically located on the senior leadership team. It doesn't have to be the head, but I guess that does no harm. This morning, we aim to take a romp through some of the key strategies and practices that we are finding helpful in trying to gift every one of our students with a reading habit for life. 
It will only be a romp through because we have half an hour for this section and to get a real sense of our school and the place of reading within it would probably need a day or two in the heart of it. But hopefully we can, by sharing our work with you, help to nourish the work in your own settings. And we very much hope that in the question and answer session after our initial presentation, our dialogue will also stimulate our own further thinking. Because as we all know, school improvement is a journey that has no destination. And the development of reading as a key component is no different to that. We are always looking for ways in which we can operate more effectively and always looking to glean from the work and the ideas of others. This initial pre-recorded presentation should, as I say, last about 30 minutes. And if I could encourage you to jot down any questions that you'd like to discuss at the end of the session and send them through, Mark and I will be live to respond. A head gardener from Kew was recently interviewed on Radio 4, and he was asked when the best time to plant a tree was. He responded using a well-known proverb that the best time was 20 years ago, and the second best time is now. The analogy in terms of a reading strategy here is that there's no time like the present to start an initiative. It doesn't need to be a major strategic overhaul rushed through in a half term. It may be just the planting of the seed. We recommend starting small, involving staff and keeping it constantly on the agenda. And at the risk of stretching the analogy to its limits, the tree constantly needs to be watered. So here's a little bit about the context in which we work. Chorney High School for Boys is an average sized 11 to 16 academy of 1200 students. It's a single sex boys school based in Luton, which is in the top 10% most deprived areas in the country. Chorney itself is based in one of Luton's most deprived wards. Pupil premium is well above the national average at 33% and 86% of our boys are classified as EAL. The vast majority are of Pakistani heritage of Kashmiri descent and our second largest but much smaller heritage group is Bengali. Kashmiri boys are one of the poorest performing groups in the country. In all year groups, the proportion of low attaining students on entry is above national and the proportion of high attaining students is below national. Reading ages are low. In years seven and eight, at any one time, we have approximately 120 students with a reading age below 9.3. This is significant as it's the minimum reading age required to successfully access the key stage three curriculum. Cultural capital, as required for success in many exams and many post-school contexts, is severely lacking in many of our students due to some of the factors above. So for us, ensuring we can help all our students become confident, fluent readers is absolutely critical. As you can see, our exam results hold up pretty robustly. These are our 2019 outcomes, the green indicating improvements on 2018. Maths results are very strong and English results even stronger. And they look particularly impressive if compared with boys only results in English. We think that a strong emphasis on reading is a key driver for sustaining and improving this level of outcome. And it is our experience that performance improves across all subjects, not just English, when we consciously work to improve our boys' confidence, their comprehension and their fluency in reading. A school that is serious about developing a rich culture of reading must ensure that the endeavour is centrally located in the school improvement plan or development plan. It needs to be at the heart of the strategic thinking about school improvement. All the strategies that we are highlighting this morning appear or have appeared in various parts of our SIP. One of the first strategies is to highlight the very clear link between reading and success. Here you see just one example of how we do that. This very large poster, which appears in communal areas of the school, this one is in our open reading area, more of that later, makes that link very clear. It aligns some of our aspirations for our stakeholders, have a look at the Read, Read, Read box, for example, to the school's outstanding English language and literature GCSE results. This is a good example, I hope, of us trying to maximise adult engagement in our students' reading, trying to encourage independent reading and to highlight meta-reading. 
So today we will focus on how we work with our context to achieve the results we do, particularly in English. In essence, how have we managed to build the bridge between our potentially limiting factors in terms of our social economic makeup of our cohort and our outcomes? In order to do this, we will examine the following. We will begin by looking at why a whole school reading strategy is critical. And in so doing, we will examine extrinsic factors such as Ofsted, exam rigor and supporting research. Next, we will take you on a virtual tour of the school, stopping at key areas central to our reading strategy and hopefully give you some reading strategy takeaways in the form of a collection of some of our key resources, which we will share with you. And finally, we will look at how we are adapting to a new normal during quarantine, yet keeping reading firmly on the home learning agenda. So what are the external extrinsic factors which compel us as a school and a nation to adopt a whole school reading policy? Firstly, the increased difficulty of the new specification is a key factor in having to address reading as a school, particularly when looking at available data. Test provider GL Assessment analysed the reading ability of 370,000 secondary pupils. They found that 25% had a reading age of 12 or below, and 20% had the skills equivalent to 11 years old and under. Worryingly, 10% had a reading age equivalent to a 9-year-old and below. A quarter of all 15-year-olds had a reading age of 12 or below, which puts them at a disadvantage in their GCSEs. As a result, they will struggle to understand questions, not only in English language, but also in subjects such as science and maths, which have become increasingly text heavy. This is because pupils need to understand the language of mathematics. They can quickly lose confidence when faced with words they thought they knew. For example, difference, prime or product that means something else in a mathematical context. Though for many, the key external agency which puts reading on the agenda is Ofsted. And it's fairly clear from page 51 of the Education Inspection Handbook that this will feature keenly in inspections. We had an earlier than expected opportunity to get an insight to how the new Ofsted framework relates to our reading strategy through a Section 8 inspection in December 2019. The team was certainly very interested in reading, including a first for me in a secondary school, listening to boys read. And this was a key paragraph in the report, or letter as it is with a Section 8, about reading. I'm pleased to say that our very historic 2007 judgment of outstanding was confirmed by the inspection, and our approaches to reading were certainly critical. And it's interesting to see a pretty clear read-through on this slide from the, from the criteria to the judgment. Note the words fluency and comprehension. We were particularly heartened by the observation that we successfully promote a love of reading, both in school and at home. Because that, of course, is absolutely what we're trying to do. We try as much as possible in school to ensure our strategies are evidence-based. And another one of our key school improvement priorities is to maximise our engagement with research. But that's a subject for a different session. The research evidence around reading, however, is pretty conclusive and always has been, of course. It's interesting to note, though, a growing understanding that reading for pleasure specifically is critical to success, as you can see from this reference to the National Literacy Trust research. And this is why it is absolutely central to our own strategies. That final bullet about the extent to which reading for pleasure trumps socioeconomic background is immensely significant, I think, in the national debate about closing the disadvantage gap. We looked more specifically at the research around whole class reading, which I can recall doing a lot of when I was at school, but which possibly has gone out of vogue a bit in the secondary sector over the last 20 years or so. Sometimes it's derided as lazy teaching. A very interesting piece of research, which you may have come across before, is just reading which looked at the impact of the faster pace of reading narratives on the comprehension of poorer adolescent readers in English classrooms. Now, poorer adolescent readers are often regarded by teachers as unable to read whole narratives, 
and so they're given short, simplified texts. There I say it differentiated, and then they're expected to analyse every part in a slow, laborious read-through. This article reports on a mixed methods study in which 20 English teachers in the south of England changed their current practice to read two whole challenging novels at a faster pace than usual in 12 weeks with their average and poorer readers aged 12 to 13. 10 of the 20 teachers received additional training in teaching comprehension. Students in both groups made eight and a half months mean progress over the 12 weeks on standardised tests of reading comprehension. But the poorer readers made a surprising 16 months progress, but with no difference made by the training programme. So simply reading challenging, complex novels aloud and at a fast pace in each lesson repositioned the poorer readers as good readers, giving them a more engaged, uninterrupted reading experience over a sustained period. However, the qualitative data showed that teachers with the additional training provided a more coherent, faster read and better supported poorer readers by explicitly teaching inference, diagnosed their students' sticking places mid-text and created socially cohesive guided reading groups that further supported weaker readers and also stretched the average to good readers. The findings then seem strongly to suggest that simply reading aloud ensures children make progress. The best progress is made when sticking points are addressed and skilled teachers' input and guidance will further improve students' reading abilities. Now, these findings exist in a context where only 32% of British children are read to daily by an adult. Most parents stop reading to their children by the age of eight, and only 19% of eight to 10-year-olds have a book read to them daily by an adult. While there may be extrinsic pressures in the form of Ofsted, the demands of the curriculum, the main reason to develop a whole school reading strategy should initially stem from the emotional rewards it gives students. We believe that if we develop an intrinsic love of reading for pleasure and the skills necessary to do so, the extrinsic rewards will naturally follow. A bit more justification, or even imperative, for a school to adopt a pervasive and coherent strategy around supporting students to read for pleasure is this striking quote from the children's author Barley Rye. Reading for pleasure is the biggest single factor in success later in life outside of an education. Study after study has shown that those children who read for pleasure are the ones who are most likely to fulfil their ambitions. If your child reads, they will succeed. It's as simple as that. First and foremost, not only does it need to sit as a whole school priority on the SIP, it needs to be very visibly modelled from the top. We were blessed to have a visit from one of our trustees, Abdul Kafour. He relayed a powerful message that an imam had told him, that children do not simply do as they are told, they copy and mimic. And with this in mind, it's absolutely vital that you identify reading champions in your school, but it really should include senior team members. And as you are now aware, we are fortunate that our head teacher is an avid reader. And in the picture you can see him reading to our year sevens, something which he does every Thursday. I love my Thursday morning sessions before school starts, reading to the students in the school library. It's a wonderful feeling to sit there reading to a small group of eager boys before registration. And as more arrive in the library to browse or to change books, a lot of them naturally gravitate towards the reading, so that typically, by the time the bell goes for registration, a group of five or six has swollen to 20 plus. This modelling is further enhanced via our form time structure, which has a strong emphasis on reading for pleasure, and was identified as a strength through the feedback in our recent Section 8 Ofsted inspection. As you can see, we strive to not only develop a love of reading, but to also increase cultural capital in terms of engaging with non-fiction and current affairs. You will notice the differentiation between reading aloud on Mondays where our form tutors read to our students, 
Those who do not feel confident enough to do so use audiobooks and reading aloud on Friday where our boys read independently. Nonfiction is developed via a subscription to the day. Many of you will know this excellent site which pulls together key news stories from around the world, links them to subject areas and makes lessons out of them. Now we have seen the extrinsic and intrinsic factors which motivate us to develop a whole school reading strategy. We've also looked at some supporting evidence, but actually there is nothing to be seen the actual environment in which it all takes place. And let's be honest, we all like to magpie ideas from other schools. So here is a brief video we made where we pick out elements of Chorney which best exemplify our reading strategy. Welcome to our virtual tour of Chorney High School for Boys. I'm Daniel Connor, I'm the head teacher. Please forgive my lockdown attire for today. And we'd just like to have a walk around the school and show you some of the things that we do to try and highlight reading in the school. So as you come into our main entrance, you can see here, here we have a display of 15 classic novels which we encourage the boys to read before they leave the school. So my name is Mark Naylor, I'm assistant head teacher here with direct responsibility for teaching and learning. Welcome to our head teacher's office. And if you look on the wall here, we can see that uh, Daniel is currently reading Middle March by George Eliot. And this is very, very powerful because as you heard earlier in our presentation, modeling is critical. If they see the adults reading and engaging with quality literature, the idea is that they will do so themselves. This, believe it or not, is a social space within the school. It's just adjacent to the school library. And this is where we have lots of our reading lessons. And the location makes it quite unique because this is a corridor and a change over time, we would have hundreds of our students walking through here, getting to witness reading in action. The entrance to our library features information regarding the book that our head teacher is currently reading to our students, which on this occasion happens to be The Call of the Wild by Jack London. Here we are in the school library, and as you can see, reading features right at the centre of our school improvement plan, and displays like this make the link between reading and achievement overall very explicit to our students. One brilliant initiative that has been launched in the last 12 months by our librarian is something we call the Sibling Shelf. And one of our key priorities is to improve the levels of reading at home and by encouraging our students to read to their brothers and sisters, we can hope to achieve this. Displays around the school feature reading and in particular focusing on the core texts which our students have to study for their GCSE exams. Needless to say, we expect all our departments to support wider reading at all levels. And here is a superb example from the history department. As head teacher of the school, I like to lead by example. And so along the library windows here, we have a summary of whatever novel I happen to be currently reading to the boys. So here we are in the English department. We all know that primary schools are superb at promoting a love of reading. And this is an idea taken directly from that phase where we have a reading corner where students within class, if they've done particularly well in their lesson as a reward, they can come over here, take a book of their choice and read in comfort. This lovely manifestation on our English uh, classroom doors, which all feature famous writers, uh, also featuring quotes from those famous writers. This is the top balcony of our English department, fairly recently built. Lovely quote there from uh, Paulo Coelho. Um, and of course, you'll recall, won't you, that in Paradise Lost, the fallen angels create pandemonium in the world, very topical just at the moment. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. Boys' schools tend to get a pretty bad press on the whole for being fairly raucous uh, uh, and poorly behaved places, but believe it or not, this is lesson change time, and as you can see how peaceful and quiet Shawnee High School for Boys is, I'd like to think that's because all the boys are in the school library reading, and not because we're locked down because of COVID-19. In summary, the key points from the tour are, over time, we want books and reading to be the very wallpaper of our school. Teachers need to be readers because, as Mark pointed out earlier, 
children tend to copy us rather than listen to us. Except, of course, when we're reading aloud and we want them to listen to us. Make sure that in addition to study support and research functions, the school library is a central area for promoting reading for pleasure. Our wonderful librarian, Marie, is herself passionate about reading for pleasure and has a wealth of knowledge through her work and her own reading about what adolescent boys enjoy. I believe that the best school librarians are often those who have developed a rich subject knowledge in the area of young people's reading. You will have noticed from the virtual tour that a lot of our reading takes place quite publicly and is often led by staff from out with the English department. We took a conscious strategic decision a couple of years ago to staff Key Stage 3 curriculum reading with PE teachers as a powerful message to all, particularly in a boys' school, that, to slightly misquote Bullock circa 1967, all teachers are teachers of reading. We also feel that the role modelling is important for some of our boys. All subjects are encouraged to build reading for pleasure into their curriculum at both Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. History has done this particularly successfully so far, closely followed by science at both key stages. Not only do some of our displays promote reading, but they also, of course, reiterate key quotes from set texts and wider literature, hopefully fastening them into students' consciousness for easy retrieval in an exam. When I attend any CPD, I always make a beeline for any freebies. The materials we are about to highlight are all available on the Google Drive link we have shared with you. We are very keen to make it clear to students, even before joining us, that reading is central to our curriculum. To help achieve this, we have worked closely with our Luton West Area Cross-Phase Partnership of Schools to create a transition passport, which is given to Year 6 pupils to complete in their Summer 2 term. Passport has a number of sections to help our students make a successful transition. But at its heart is the focus on reading. Each year we identify a novel which we would like our students to engage with over the summer holiday. They then have a summer project where they need to research the author and create a number of subject specific tasks relating to that novel. This then becomes the first text they will study in year seven for their cross curricular reading project. More on this in a minute. So on their very first day at Chorney, we collect their projects on arrival and the 10 best receive a phone call home. We also identify a key stage three reading list with the challenge to have read 12 by the time they finish year eight. As mentioned, the transition passport and its summer project lead directly into our cross-curricular reading project. Every boy in year seven and eight is given a copy of the novel, a project workbook and a popper wallet and all teachers receive a copy too. To date, these novels have included Holes, Private Peaceful, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The workbook has a combination of traditional individual comprehension style tasks and group work, which is subject specific and linked directly to the central themes of the novel. These tasks are actually created by the respective departments themselves. The project work requires a degree of teamwork and research the results of which are put into the group scrapbook. The best scrapbooks are then voted for by our student executives, with the winning team and their form tutor receiving tickets to popular West End shows. Previous winners have been to The Lion King and Swan Lake. We were keen to do everything we could to make sure that we didn't lose impetus during lockdown. So we've been encouraging staff to record their reading aloud and promoting books to our students through the school YouTube channel. My contribution has been Treasure Island. Here's a small taster clip for you. You guineas, roared Merry, shaking it at Silver. That's your £700,000, is it? You're the man for bargains, ain't you? You're him that never bungled nothing, you wooden-headed lubber. Dig away, boys, said Silver, with the coolest insolence. You'll find some pig nuts, and I shouldn't wonder. Pig nuts, repeated Mary in a scream. Mates, do you hear that? I tell you now, that man there knew it all along. Look in the face of him and you'll see it wrote there. Ah, Mary, remarked Silver, 
standing for captain again. You're a pushing lad, to be sure. And Mark's has been the Julia Donaldson stories to promote family reading at home. We encourage our boys, if they have younger siblings, to take responsibility for reading with them. Here's a short clip of Mark reading The Gruffalo. The Gruffalo by Julia Donaldson A mouse took a stroll through the deep, dark wood. A fox saw the mouse, and the mouse looked good. Where are you going to, little brown mouse? Come and have lunch in my underground house. It's terribly kind of you, fox, but no. I'm going to have lunch with a, a gruffalo. A gruffalo? What's a gruffalo? A gruffalo? Why didn't you know? He has terrible tusks and terrible claws and terrible teeth. I post a weekly message to students on the YouTube every Monday and often take the opportunity to give reading for pleasure a hard sell. Here's a short clip of the sort of thing I say. So if you are not already reading for pleasure every day, start today. Just 10 minutes and then build up from there. If you like adventure, try reading Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. It is totally classic. A story of treachery, courage and romance in the wild Scottish Highlands. It's about David Balfour a handsome and wealthy young man whose luck runs out. His wicked uncle wants to get his hand on young David's fortune, and he doesn't care what it takes. He'll even kidnap him. That's the start of this book, one of the best adventure stories ever written. How will it end? Expect shipwrecks, betrayals, and a heart-stopping chase across the rugged Scottish wilds. Following this session today, you may want to have a virtual discussion with your teams to ascertain which elements you may want to use moving forward. To help you in our shared Google Drive, along with the cross-curricular reading projects and transition projects, we've included a summary sheet of all the key points of Chorney's reading strategy. So, that's the end of our Whistle Stop tour. And because of time, it is only a fairly brief summary. We haven't, for example, covered our parental engagement strategies our specific interventions for those with the very lowest reading ages, or our curriculum organisation to support weaker readers. We wanted this morning to focus on promoting that all-important ethos, culture and expectation around reading for pleasure. I do hope it was reasonably interesting and that it will help your own thinking about reading in your setting. We'll be available live now to respond to some of the questions that have been sent through. Thank you for listening and enjoy your reading. Welcome back. Uh, a fascinating um, area to discuss. And I can see by the questions that have come through already, it's, it's really um, evoked some responses in terms of your views on how reading should be dealt with. I've got my books. I'll share those with you uh, in a bit in terms of what I'm reading at the moment. Just to let you know, over on Twitter, we have Anne Palmer taking over our Twitter at Chilton TSA. Make sure you engage with us and use the hashtag LD EduChat. And as Mark and Daniel have said, they are actually going to be sharing a good catalogue of resources with you, which we will get out to you. Uh, in a shareable form during the course of the next 24 hours. The things we've discussed will be shared with you. Without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Daniel and Mark to the E stage. And as you can see, we are social distancing. They have confirmed that is two metres. Uh, don't sway towards the middle of the table. And um, it was a no mean feat uh, walking around a school with no students in to show you the culture of the school with everything they were doing to actually maintain their social distancing and all the guy following all the guidance that's needed at the moment. So thank you for putting that together for us. Uh, right, well, first of all, um, thanks for referencing the importance of social distancing. I know there's a lot of debates about how long that distance should be, one metre, two metres. Uh, on this topic, I believe that Shakespeare's preference was for five metres. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave that there hanging. Okay. The um, I'd, I'd like to start off, uh, if I may, first of all, by thanking you, Arden, uh, and thanking the Trust for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, and indeed, thanking you for the absolutely fantastic sessions that have been running so far. And uh, I want to reference yesterday's session in just a moment in particular. Uh, and really leading into that, there was a comment right at the beginning of the presentation by Mariam 
uh, about the comment was what could be more fundamental than reading. And uh, that's so true, Marion. And I think that feeds right into the conversations that were taking place yesterday uh, around the Black Lives Matter movement. And the fundamental place of reading within our curriculum development in schools uh, to tackle some of those issues of endemic racism and injustice uh, in wider society. You know, great literature, good literature, good writing is by its nature, nature subversive. Uh, uh, and many of us, I know, have been formed by what we have read growing up. Uh, you know, whether that's, uh, in my case, for example, uh, developing a really rich understanding of tyranny and the danger of sort of exploitative capitalism through uh, my favorite novel, Moby Dick, or whether it's through an understanding of hypocritic, uh, um, hypocritical political systems, uh, particularly in the development of the Western world through the reading of Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, or as, as an adolescent starting to engage with some of the uh, really painful aspects of injustice and racism through reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And as I became an adult and engaged more widely, much more diverse literature, uh, and I mean some of the best literature in the world now is by African writers, uh, in particular, um, uh, certainly the literature in English anyway, um, that, that's been fundamentally formative. And so I think really this whole issue of uh, supporting our students in schools to become really competent, able, analytical, intelligent readers uh, is even more important in that quest that we hopefully are adding renewed vigor to uh, as a result of the Black Lives Movement. So that's just referencing back to yesterday's conversation, which as I say was really powerful and really important. And thank you very much, Arv, and all your colleagues for, for, for facilitating that. Um, there's a, a really interesting question coming through, and, and obviously the presentation is very much about culture, old school culture, a really question, question came through from Badra about uh, how we encourage reluctant readers uh, and, uh, and I think that is a key and we're thinking here particularly about reluctant readers rather than weak readers because one of our missions is to give boys a love of reading that will sustain them for the rest of their lives. Um, Mark, I don't know, do you, do you want to start off taking Yeah, I can do. I mean, I, I have uh, three boys at home, so this is a, you know, a constant issue for myself in terms of reluctant reading. But in terms of our school, I think it, often it's about uh, confidence, maybe, or it's about expectation. And, you know, we strive to inspire both in our students. And, you know, the very first expectation that we put forward in our transition when we visit the schools is that reading will be a part of your life here. And, you know, a Chorney boy is synonymous with being a Chorney reader. And we referenced in the, you know, the presentation the fact that we have our summer project uh, and the project itself is research based around a particular author that they will experience when they start in September. So right even before they come to our school, they know that reading will be a fundamental part. And when they arrive on that first day, as I said, you know, they are all clutching their research projects based on that particular author. And we call home for the 10, you know, the parents of the 10 best, uh, the boys who produce the 10 best projects. And I've had parents crying with joy on the phone because they've made such a positive start. Mm. And again, it's, it's that positivity, it's the promotion, promotion uh, of success in reading that's, that's absolutely critical. Um, so what we're looking to do in the school in terms of those reluctant readers really is to create that sort of critical mass. Uh, it's that 80-20 rule, isn't it? You know, if you get 80% 80, 80 on board, hopefully the 20% will follow. Um, and it's also important to tap in initially, if they are very reluctant, tap into their intrinsic motivation. What are they interested in? So, you know, if they're interested in reading, you know, uh, blogs on Fortnite, uh, if they want to read uh, some nonfiction, if they're interested in graphic novels, if they want to read comics, so be it. Anything that is a gateway to reading is absolutely critical. I started my reading journey with the Beano. I still remember when the sound of the magazine dropping through the letterbox, it was the best sound of the week. And, you know, then I moved into going to bookshops with my father and buying the Tintin and the Asterix. And these are all gateway, uh, you know, periods of your life where you, you progress to better quality literature, of course. But do be careful in terms of that intrinsic uh, motivation. It does need to be balanced with good quality literature. Now, 
I'm really happy that the, the section that was used for the, for the reading to siblings was taken from the Gruffalo. Now, as I said, I'm a father of four children. I, I've probably read this five million times and that is, there's no hyperbole there at all. Um, and just what I want to do is just to highlight the quality of literature that we expose two-year-olds to. And then I'll just take you on to another journey about what we do when they get to secondary school. So I'll just read the opening excerpt. Do, do, do spare me this now, this moment of indulgence. So a mouse took a stroll through the deep dark wood, knowing straight away stroll, we've got a high level verb. Um, and then I'll jump on. It's terribly kind of you, Fox, but no. Now, terribly kind, that's an infrequently used adverb. Uh, and it's quite a high level collocation. We don't normally use that. And then as we go on, a gruffalo. What's a gruffalo? A gruffalo? Why didn't you know? Now here we've used the past simple verb to do, and it's used to express a mocking tone. So even in that very first page of a piece of literature that we read to two-year-olds, or I certainly do in my house, on a frequent basis, we have higher quality literature. Now we fast forward, and possibly, you know, you're all familiar with the Wimpy Kids. Uh, you know, I've got bookshelves at home groaning with these, and, you know, uh, Jeff Kinney's made a fair few quid out of this, I would say. I'll read the opening paragraph here. It's been almost two and a half weeks since me and my ex-best friend, Rowley Jefferson, had our big fight. Now, you can see the difference. This is something that would be picked up for intrinsic motivation by our year sevens. But actually, the quality of literature is higher with the Gruffalo who we reach two and three year olds. So great to focus on the intrinsic and to get those reluctant readers hooked. But it must be balanced with higher quality literature where we can build vocabulary. Uh, in terms of reluctant readers, there's so much you can do. Um, tech is a gateway. Um, you know, students might prefer to use e-readers, um, might prefer to listen to audio books. And, you know, recent research has suggested that there's been a 138% uh, increase in the use of audio books in the last year. And it's certainly not a deficit model either. Um, you know, the, the belief is that uh, much of the same cognitive processes are used, whether it's in print version uh, or whether you are actually listening to it. Um, so many of the same cognitive processes are used and it's very, very good for mental health and emotional well-being as well. So research shows that you know, comprehension skills uh, transcend modality. It doesn't matter whether it's you're listening to it or whether you're reading it. And then, of course, we're in a boys' school. Now, what better way to get reluctant readers reading is to make it competitive. And we use Accelerated Reader uh, Program. Many of you will be familiar with this, but the very fact that you, your words that you've in, in, engaged with are counted, you have a millionaire, so when you've read a million words and you get prizes for this, certificates for this. You know, this these are all drivers of bringing boys, or well, certainly in our school, in, into, into the reading fold. Um, and then recognize that, recognize that success, make it public, make reading acceptable, make it, you know, embrace it, make it cool. Uh, so the boy who walks around with a book is perfectly normal. The boy who's, you know, in, in between lessons and he's walking around reading the book, that's perfectly normal, it's accepted. And that leads me into my final point with regards to reluctant reading and reluctant readers, sorry. You have to create a safe environment. So boys in our school, we have to create an environment within lessons where they don't fear ridicule if they don't feel they are the most skilled readers. We're here to support them and they have to know that, that we are here to improve their reading accuracy and fluency and we'll be on that journey with them. Thanks very much, Mark. I and mean, that was a really rich and well-informed answer, really helpful. And if I can just pick up maybe one or two further points around that. Uh, Lee made a comment uh, through the presentation there, really uh, excellent comment, Lee, I thought, about the importance of sharing reading uh, and sharing that love of reading. And of course, that feeds into the modeling and everything. And I, I quite agree with you, Lee, that we really need to put more and more emphasis on that in schools. And that's where a lot of our reading aloud is centered as well. And, and again, we kind of use lockdown as a bit of an opportunity to roll that reading aloud program out even further. So even since we, we put that uh, uh, video together, we've got a whole series of books now for our HPL students, um, uh, 1984, 
for um, uh, handling bus wheels, the handle bus wheels, and so on and so forth. And we've also uh, started the project now of encouraging the boys uh, to uh, submit themselves for um, uh, auditions to be readers allowed themselves. So we can post those on YouTube and the first ones have, have gone out of those as well. So again, I think picking up these points using the recording of reading, reading aloud as a way of just sharing the joy of it and, and the love of it is really powerful. Um, and the, the final thing that I'd like to just pick up on this particular question is the importance of parents. Now, of course, we, we reference that uh, with our references to our attempts to promote uh, uh, sibling reading, uh, you know, encouraging boys to read to their younger brothers and sisters at home and to have shared reading at home. We also run parental engagement sessions where we invite parents to come into school and we actually model for parents as well how they can support reading at home. We model paired reading to them, we share resources with them. It's often in those sessions that we're, again, picking up the competitive element, uh, we'll set up a competition with something like a Kindle, for example, to prize at the end, uh, for the end of it. So, uh, yeah, I suppose it's really just about keeping the energy going uh, on all those fronts to encourage reluctant readers. Um, I think we, we, we also, uh, uh, some quite a lot of interest, we spoke quite a lot about lockdown reading, but quite a lot of interest also in uh, possibly the notion of well, shall I, uh, I don't mean this pejoratively, but reluctance teachers. Uh, so yeah. we have an expectation in school, for example, that all our form teachers will read aloud uh, in form time. Uh, and I don't think actually, to be fair to my staff, any of them are reluctant to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the wonderful things about working here is the way the team buys into our strategic intents. But uh, I mean, the, the, certainly some people may not feel as confident as others to do that. Um, so uh, it's important that we support each other in that. And that, again, I think is where the whole notion of the audio books uh, can play a, an important part. Um, Mark, I don't know if you yeah, want I'm, to... I mean, I would, yeah, I, would, I, I would challenge the, uh, the collocation there of reluctant teachers. I don't think they are reluctant. And I'm sure my next comment is going to be a lot of nods around the land. And it's, going to, it's time, it's time questions. It's, it's not that uh, teachers are reluctant readers. They really do feel that, you know, the, the stress of not having enough time. Uh, and, you know, by the, by the nature of their, you know, the jobs that we do. Um, but having said that, teachers are highly skilled readers, just by dint of the qualifications they have uh, and by dint of the daily demands of the job. And, you know, and you'll all be nodding again, just by, reading all your emails uh, and responding to them that is a reading skill in itself so it it might be confidence or it might just be something that's taking you out of your comfort uh, your comfort zone but in terms of um, you know this phrase reluctant teachers which again i challenge uh, you know one one way around it might be the use of the audio books or, or reading as a form or identifying um, reading champion skilled readers uh, within your own class who can read to the group because I'm not sure about schools around the world, but in our school, the boys are very, very eager to to actually participate in group reading. I mean, if you ask for a volunteer, you would have, you know, most of the hands in the class being put up. Um, so use use your resources well within the class. It doesn't have to be yourself. It could be an audiobook or a skilled reader. And then I would also say, as a, and just to echo what was said in the actual video identify reading champions in terms of staff within your school. I mean, there's so much rich reading that goes on around our staff body that, you know, it's that 80-20 rule, you know, if 80% of your staff body are reading and reading regularly, then that, you know, the rest of the staff body will be picked up on the enthusiasm and carried along, uh, which these 80% give. Um, so that, that would be important as well, identifying reading champions, not only in your staff, but also in your student body as well. But I would say ultimately teachers, we're, we're professionals and whether we feel comfortable um, reading aloud to our class or not, we know this is research informed practice. We know the positive impact of, of reading to our class and ultimately this will prevail. And as a profession, you know, we know if it works, we'll do it.
definitely um just while you're thinking about where you want to go next i just want to remind people that the resources are going to be made available in a shareable um folder later for you and don't forget to engage with us on our chiltern teaching school alliance twitter handle which is chiltern tsa at chiltern tsa and our youtube channel chiltern teaching school alliance and i just want to give a nod to um to our wonderful peacock by the way who has contributed <laughs> has been contributed and not been acknowledged throughout this whole session as um, Dr. Patrice Evans did acknowledge the peacock I, I want to point out and it is the same peacock for those people that uh, were there for her session. And the peacock is an avid reader we just like to point out. Yes yeah so where do you want to jump to next? Um, okay it'd, it'd be quite useful to explore a little bit further um, the, the, the whole notion of trying to continue to drive reading during lockdown and, and while yeah. only some of our students are coming to school because uh, there's a lot of anxiety um, quite rightly about the danger of, of, of a learning gap uh, over the six months or so that a lot of students aren't getting much schooling at the moment. Um, so again, as I say, we've put a lot of thought into how we might do that in terms of providing access and, uh, 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 and encouraging, encouraging reading at home. Uh, Mark, do you want to pick up one or two of the points um, around that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not all doom and gloom in, in terms of reading levels because um, recent surveys have shown there's been, you know, a surge in reading for pleasure at home. I think it's something like, you know, 37% of 7 to 11 year olds report that they're reading more than before lockdown. So, you know, it, it is not all, it's not all bad news, but, you know, there is some very worrying research out there in terms of uh, access to literature at home and the impact or the detrimental impact it can have on you if you don't have access to, to books at home. I mean, Daniel and I were reflecting that when we were younger, you know, you'd have a magazine rack, there'd be your daily newspaper coming through the door, you, you know, there'd be all sorts of magazines, periodicals next to the settee, there'd be bookshelves groaning with books. And as we come to, you know, merging into a sort of digital age now, there's less and less print around. And to the extent that the research suggests that there's something like 400,000 students around the country who, have, who do not own a copy of their own book, so they do not have one. Now, this is, this, is, this is fundamentally important because the research also shows that if you do own a book at home, just one, um, then you're three times more likely to enjoy reading and you're six times more likely to have a reading age that is above your chronological age. So, I would say that it's uh, very, very important for us as educators to make sure that our students have access to literature. Now, you can't always do that in a printed form, but what we've really tried to do during the lockdown period is to make sure that there's some really high quality uh, audio material out there, which Daniel alluded to before, so at least they can engage with some form of literature there. Uh, and, if you're, and also, if you are um, building into your school priorities, like the cross-curricular reading project, and you are making sure that everyone has a copy of quality literature in Key Stage 3, and you are making sure that everyone has a reading book in their bag at all times from the library, then if we are in a situation where they have been sent home, that at least they have got something they can start with. They do have that one book in which to build upon. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, just, I think I've got time for one final uh, uh, point, yep. have I? Oh, yep. Yes, you have, yep. yep. Lovely, good, thanks. So um, I think the, the other issue that is really, really important, obviously, uh, in a strategic development like this to bear in mind is uh, the students who have low level reading ability, uh, whether that's through special educational needs or through other aspects of uh, educational deprivations that come through the system. Uh, and we haven't really covered that today. That's not what this session is about. Uh, but it is really important, obviously, uh, to have a very clear uh, learning support strategy around that, which is based on things like, uh, uh, even, even in the secondary sector, a coherent approach to phonics, uh, a coherent approach to your curriculum organisation, so that you're getting rich literacy and, uh, and number work to the right students at the right time in the right curriculum pathway, uh, that you're working really hard to develop that safe environment. Uh, and in particular, I would say, to build in time to your pedagogy and build in time to your curriculum for students to talk about reading. Uh, uh, and I think that if that was one final point I would, I would, I would make, it is the importance of reflecting upon reading, talking about reading, 
And when you go into a classroom and let's, uh, uh, to observe a lesson, and they've been reading, and you stop the lesson, and you get them to talk about that, it's always inspiring to me, I find, uh, to, to feel the energy and hear the energy and the enthusiasm of the boys when they're talking about what they've just been reading. So I think it's probably the final point I would want to make. I think there was one or two people asking if they could visit uh, yeah. at some stage. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, just get in touch. Uh, uh, Chorley uh, House with the boys, you'll see the website where you can get in touch with us. And by all means, uh, give us a ring and, and uh, more than happy to welcome visitors and, and show you yeah. around and talk to you about it. Yeah, and obviously the emails that are coming out from, from us, if, if there is something that you want to do, you can also just email us as well and we can forward the, uh, your details on to... Uh, and also, I've actually, sorry, I almost forgot that we're also intending to uh, organise a leadership development day at some point in the future where it can be a bit more organised rather than a, just a random visit. Yep. Yeah, absolutely yeah okay well okay thank you so much um uh, uh, lots of questions lots of things around this and i think um i think what we take away from my point of view is is that it, it's something that needs to be embedded rather than a, an explicit thing but there is a need for that as well there is a time and a place for, to make it explicit as well but having that reading culture where it feels normal to read and it's that safe environment that you talked about and i suppose the only thing that i would walk away with is uh, I, I i mean i read to my daughter you read to your children we have got homes where the parents themselves lack that confidence as well and i think like you said that's a whole other th area that we could be talking about parental engagement and how do we get parents on board i think um if there is anything that you can share on that that we can put together when we send out some information to all the attendees that would be really good as well because i think that is something that especially in, in the area that we work in that is sometimes an issue in itself where parents are not able to engage in the way that perhaps we want them to. So thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thanks very much. Yeah. And I'm just going to share with everybody uh, this stack behind me. Um, I tend to read two or three different books because I'm, I'm, I, I, I dip in and out. This is one that you wouldn't read to your children. Do not read this to your children. Um, but it's a brilliant book by Will Self called uh, Great Apes. It really twists your mind. We've got the last book that I finished was um, this one here, which is a bookseller of Kabul. Gave me uh, a different perspective on uh, different cultures. And then because of the sessions that we've been running, um, I had got this one bought to me by a friend. Uh, and I tweeted that one, which is uh, Alex Bellos, which is Alex through the looking glass, which is how life is reflected through numbers. And then I went and bought his other book, his first book, which is Adventures in Numberland. And then for some reason, I saw this one, which is Humble Pie, which is uh, a comedy of maths errors. Uh, I'll let you figure that one out. And as a teacher must, I would highly recommend this book. It really gets you to think about how the brain works and the research behind it. The fact that um, nothing is as fixed as we think it is and there is still always room to grow. So that's what I've been dipping into <laughs> over the last few weeks. Do read, do share your reading. Uh, it'd be really good to see actually on Twitter today if you can take a picture of the books that you've been reading for yourself or to your children to be fair if you're in that situation as i do um and some some of the parents that i know really don't like me for this i normally as gifts to their children buy them books and i still do gift vouchers for books um, because i want them to read <laughs> So Twitter at Chilton TSA, do engage with us, send us the pictures of what you're reading. That'd be really, really good. This session is recorded, will be made available to you at our Chilton Teaching School Alliance uh, YouTube channel. Go on over there, click subscribe. We want you to have access to all the con content that we provide free of charge. Make sure you share it with your colleagues. Uh, that's probably even more important for those that haven't been able to join us, especially as we enter into this next phase of school reopening. Next week, we have got a fantastic, fantastic week ahead. It's again, such a big range of topics that we're looking at. So on Monday, we've got Teresa Kelly, who'll be looking at budgets. So those of you that are completely oblivious to how schools financially keep going and how they juggle the intricacies of where money needs to be spent, Teresa Kelly will be looking at from an insider's perspective, um, school budgets. And then we've got Sir David Carter. Um, who will be looking at succession planning and how do we how do we mould and create our new leaders that are going to be leading our next generation? Then we've got Stephen Mumby who's looking at imperfect leadership, and then we're finding uh, following up.
ending the week, should I say, with Oliver Caviglioli, who will be looking at dual coding with teachers. So a fantastic week ahead. Um, and just to remind you, our Black Lives Matter webinar has been edited and uploaded onto our YouTube channel. That's the one I really want you to hang on and really share that as, as, to as many people as you can. That was not the only thing that we're going to be doing. Uh, we are going to be following that through with other things in different ways. So do keep an eye out for what we do. This is another week of hashtag LD EduChat, leadership development and education online for you for free. See you next week. This is Arv Kalshaw. Bye.